Thank you, Martin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about um, experimental cancer therapy today. Um, but before I go into it, I just want to point you to a few disclosures I have uh, down here. So I'm co-founder of a few companies that may or may not be relevant for this talk here. Um, so I'm going to tell you a, a story, case story, if you like, um, from my research uh, that is concerned with not not uh, that mosquito there, but what lives inside that mosquito. Um, and it's going to be a story about uh, the successes and challenges, mostly challenges, of uh, developing a novel uh, type of cancer treatment uh, using biologics and immunotherapy approaches. Um, and I'll come back to, to the mosquito here in just a second. Um, it all really started um, because I was interested in similarities between the placental compartment and the malignant compartment. And the reason for that is that the placenta has many features that resembles cancer uh, quite extraordinarily. Uh, for example, you have an organ that has to proliferate into a 500 gram organ in 40 weeks. So it has a high proliferation rate. You also have an organ that can invade into adjacent tissue. And you have a massive angiogenesis going on because it has to feed the organ and it also has to invade the human immune system. So all these features here are actually similar to cancer. So my whole uh, entrance to this level of research is because I think we can learn something about cancer by studying the placenta. Um, there are many parasites that has evolved a specific taste for certain compartments in the human body. And one of them is the malaria parasite Plasmodium falciparum. Um, it has a quite complex life cycle, as you can see here, but if you focus on the red part, that's what's going on inside the human host. Then when the mosquito injects its small sporozoids into the human blood circulation, then it goes to the liver, and inside the hepatocytes it proliferates, matures, and then it comes out of the liver again as small immature parasites. Um, and when it comes out of the liver, it's extremely vulnerable to the human immune defense. And therefore, it invades a red blood cell immediately to hide from the human immune system. Um, inside the red blood cell, the parasite has an, faces a new problem. And the problem is that infected red blood cells are usually very efficiently cleared in the spleen. So it needs to evolve a strategy that can retain it inside the human host and so it can avoid splenic clearance. The way it does it is that it expresses surface molecules on top, on the outside of the red blood cells that can anchor the infected red blood cells to specific sites in the human body. Um, and a few of them, um, it, it really goes like this. So when the infected red blood cells comes here from the left, then it bounces down the pipe and uh, as soon as it can find something to grab onto, it will do that. And in that way, it can exit circulation and buy time to finish its life cycle inside the human host. If it doesn't bind anything, it will be cleared in the spleen. So there are many different sites in the body where the malaria parasite can bind. Um, the most studied one is probably the brain malaria subtype. <coughs> where you have accumulation of uh, small uh, parasites inside red blood cells in the brain, and that gives rise to severe brain malaria in children. It can also um, sequester in the bone and in the lung through other mechanisms that are not completely known yet. And then there is this fourth type, if you like, uh, where you have a scenario where the blood cells express a protein that is called var 2 csa on the surface. And that protein can specifically anchor the red blood cells to the placenta in the susutium of the placenta. 
So you have a whole placenta that will be full of these small red blood cells um, when you have this uh, type of disease going. And um, it doesn't bind a protein there. It binds a glycan or a glycosaminoglycan. And the glycosaminoglycan is a secondary modification that sits on a protein. And it specifically binds the subtype called chondroitin sulfate A. Or chondroitin sulfate, I'm not sure if you can find it up here. You can see this here. I can use the pointer here. So we are up here, this type here. Okay. So, um, so this is the, the type of chondroitin or type of glycan that the parasite binds in the placenta. Um, it looks like this. Uh, here you have some electron microscopy pictures of an uh, infected red blood cell that uh, sits inside the syncytium. And you can almost see the interaction here with the glycans sitting here. And this is the underlying mechanism behind pregnancy-associated malaria in endemic regions of the world that kills more than 200,000 people a year. Um, Chondroitin sulfate has been known in cancer for four decades. So it has been sporadically described in basically any type of cancer that they express apparent levels and um, uh, uh, subtypes of chondroitin sulfate. But because of the fact that glycans are extremely hard to work with on the molecular basis, this has not really been uh, pursued uh, as targets before, simply because of technology um, issues. Um, so basically what we um, hypothesized at that time was that, could it be that the placenta and cancer express the same type of chondroitin sulfate, glycosaminoglycan, um, due to the similarities between the two organs? And if that is true, then we should be able to use uh, evolutionary refined malaria protein as a therapy against cancer. So this was actually the first uh, experiment that we did at that point. So here you have um, infected red blood cells from pregnant women in Tanzania. It's the small black dots here. And then you have different types of cancer cells. And what we could see was that when we added infected blood cells to the cancer cells, then they all bound up on the cancer cells. So that was the first indication that cancer cells expressed a similar type of chondroitin sulfate as the placenta. If we then took chondroitin sulfate that was purified from the placenta and added it on to this mixture here, then we could completely outcompete the binding between the infected red blood cells and the tumor cells. So that is really the proof that you have an interaction between the red blood cells and the tumor cells that goes through chondroitin sulfate. Okay. This is the full-length malaria protein, the gray one here. It's a 355 kilodalton protein. It's a massive protein that is expressed by the parasite and transported through two membranes outside on the outer surface of the erythrocyte. The red part here is the minimal binding domain of that protein that is required for the interaction with chondroitin sulfate. And that protein sequence is about 72 kilodaltons, and they can be, it can be made recombinant. Um, this protein here, it binds uh, trophoblastic cells, as we would expect, with uh, quite some strength. And it also do not bind any primary cell line or cell that is taken from the human, which we would expect because this type of malaria can only sequester in the placenta, in the human host. It cannot bind anywhere else in the human body. If we look at cancer cells, then we saw that uh, this malaria protein here can bind any type of tumor cell line that you would like from any of the three lineages the hematopoietic lineage and the epithelial and also the mesenchymal lineage. And again, in all cases, if you add purified CSA to this, then you can completely outcompete the binding between the recombinant protein 
and the cell light. So again here we have a CSA specific interaction. So CSA looks like this. This is the disaccharide that is comprised of a glucuronic acid and a gamma residue. And then they sit like this in chains after each other in an ordered fashion on a long string. And these chains can be very, very long. Much bigger molecular weight-wise than proteins. What makes it special is that it has a sulfation sitting on carbon atom number four of the Galnac residue. And what you can see here is that if we titrate increasing concentrations in of this protein, then you can compete out the binding to the tumor cell line. If you then treat the cell lines with an enzyme that also removes the chondroitin sulfate from the surface, then you can also block the binding. But if you take a different type of chondroitin sulfate, or different type of sulfated glycosaminoglycan, then you are not able to compete the binding. So the difference between the scenario in the middle and the one to the, to the left is that the sulfation is not sitting here on carbon atom number four, but is sitting on carbon atom number six. And that is enough to lose the binding specificity between the malaria protein and the actual molecule. So the next question is, of course, um, if we want to learn something about this target, what is the target? What makes this type of chondroitin sulfate special? And for that, we um, developed a number of, of quite complicated mass spectrometry approaches called tandem mass spectrometry and liquid chronotography mass spectrometry. But in the end, what we found here was that the protein binds a stretch of chondroitin sulfate that is at least a 14 mer. So it has 14 of these sugar molecules sitting there. And it's 100% sulfated. And in six, uh, 6 to 1 ratio, it has the sulfation sitting on carbon atom number 4. If we then look at this in another way and compare what we call crude chondroitin sulfate A. This is the type of chondroitin sulfate we have in all our joints, for example. Many people eat chondroitin sulfate for arthritis as a supplement. Huh? I don't think there's actually solid proof about the effect from, uh, from eating it as a supplement, but uh, I'm sure some people will disagree with me. So what you can see here is that um, when we mass spec characterize what we call normal chondroitin sulfate, then you have a portion of it that is non-sulfated. It's about 10%. And then you have 90% of it that is uh, monosulfated, has one sulfation, and none of it is disulfated. Um, you can also see that the ratio between C4 sulfation and C6 sulfations is... 80% C4 and 20% C6. But if you look at the placenta and the cancer scenario, then you see that they are basically all monosulfated. They are all sulfated. And the vast majority of the sulfations are actually sitting on carbon-4. So this is what makes that type of chondroitin sulfate special. When we looked at um, chondroitin sulfate or this type of placental chondroitin sulfate in, in normal tissue, there's very little interaction with normal tissue. And this is what we would expect because this parasite can only bind in the placenta. What you can see here in the placenta to the bottom right on the screen here, that you actually have this very strong interaction to the placental syncytium using that. Uh, recombinant malaria protein. When we look in tumors, there is a strong reaction to basically any type of cancer. It's not like all tumors express it, but between 70% to 90% of the tumors, they will express this. And the expression is bigger in mesenchymal type cancers, so either sarcoma type cancers or epithelial type cancer that has undergone EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. It is less expressed in hematopoietic cancers. 
but it's still there. So how is this presented on, on the cells? So it sits on proteins, as I mentioned before. So it's a modification that comes on to the protein after the protein has been made. And one of the most uh, studied proteoglycans, as they are called, that carries a CS modification is this one here, CSPG4, CS proteoglycan 4. It has been described in multiple different types of cancers, mainly in sarcomas, but also in breast cancer. Um, and melanoma, by the way. And what we can see here is that CSPG4 and the recombinant malaria protein bar 2 here, it co-localizes very exactly on the tumor cells. This is a melanoma cells for melanoma cell just for the illustration. We can also see that we can purify this protein on immobilized VAR2 proteins. And what we can see here is that we actually purify the glycosylated modified form of the CSPG4. This is the normal preform of it. This is the modified form. And this is really what we pull down, what we bind with the recombinant malaria protein. We can also use a relatively new fancy technique called proximity ligation assays to visualize this. So this is a, 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 a method where you bind two things with two different uh, binders. And then if they are in proximity together, they will develop a light signal. Okay, so this is what you see. Um, so, what we could see was that many of the tumor cells that we could bind with the malaria protein did not express CSPG4. For example, if you take the prostate cancer cell line, PC3, it's a very good binder, but it doesn't express CSPG4. So, it means that there must be other proteoglycans that can carry the same modification. And this is interesting because this means that there could be a redundant presentation of the actual glycosaminoglycan that we can target with the malaria protein. So to search for that, we did a functional gain of function screen in a non-tumogenic human kidney cell line called HIC293 that we knew we could boost to bind the VAR2 protein if we stress the cell line or really increase the concentration of the recombinant VAR2 protein. So what we did here was that we arrayed 3,500 cDNAs that encoded for plasma membrane proteins inside the cell line. And then we screened for which of those cDNAs that could regain binding or make the cell regain binding to the recombinant protein. And after validations and treatments and, and all this, we came up with 17 hits. And those are the hits. And there are some famous members here in between here, for example, CD44 is a very uh, important protein in many types of cancers. So these proteins are modified with uh, a chondroitin sulfate chain. And that can be validated again. This is the same thing as I showed you before. It's just with CSPG4. And it's basically the same scenario. We can pull down the glycosylated form and it gives a PLA signal. So this is how we validate the, bio, the actual modification. We can also do it in another way. We can immobilize the VAR2 protein on magnetic beads. And those magnetic beads should be able to bind everything that has an, what we call an oncofetal type CS chain sitting on it. So if you take a protein lysate from a tumor cell line or some tissue and add those beads to it, these beads will bind all the components in there that actually have this modification, like this. And then we can mass spec it, so we can identify what are the proteins. And then we get a whole list of proteins that has been identified via mass spec as associated with an oncofetal chondroitin sulfate chain. And here again, we get just an example, we get down CSPG4 and we get down CD44 again as a positive controls. What we could see was that many of the proteins that were modified were actually integrins. So integrins are specific proteins in the membrane of cells that are extremely important for the motility of the cells. 
If you don't have the integrins, you cannot move, basically, as a cell. And again here, we could see that it's, it's modified and, and it's glycosylated and it gives a PLA signal. Um, what we could see here is um, that if you do a very simple assay, this is called a scratch assay or wound healing assay. You take some cells and then you make a wound with a pipette tip or whatever you have on hand through the culture and then you actually assay for how fast can these cells close the wound. And if you have VAR2 in there, the cells are not able to move at all. They just sit there. But if you have a control recombinant protein unrelated to the VAR2 binding sequence, then they can close the wound. And that can be very nicely quantified, and you can also rescue this by adding purified chondroitin sulfate to this reaction. And you can also you do invasion assays, and you can do migration assays in many different cell lines. And in all cases, you see that if you sprinkle a little bit of R2 to these cells here, they just sit there, don't move at all. So that, of course, uh, suggests that uh, these uh, glycosaminoglycans might play a role in metastasis. And this actually supports this very well. So this is an animal model where you take a metastatic cell line and then you inject it into the left ventricle of the heart. And in this scenario here, it will develop aggressive metastasis in liver and in bone in about 50% of the animal. And what you have here in green is the binding of the VAR2 protein. It has been linked to a fluorescent molecule. It's called a FITS, FITSIA488. And what you have in blue is uh, the uh, nucleus, is the DNA, so you can see the metastasis there. And what you see here is that this very nicely bind to the metastasis. If you then take the mice and inject them in the heart, but now you have VAR2 in there with them. So now the cells have been exposed to the VAR2 protein, then they cannot metastasize. So this was really uh, the first functional evidence that these proteoglycans are actually involved in motility of tumor cells. So this is really uh, the proof that uh, if you inject the VAR2 protein into uh, uh, an animal, then it can seek out, it can find the tumor and bind to the tumor. This is going to be important for the remaining of the talk. So here you have it linked to a near-infrared tracer. It's a fluorescent molecule, again, that we can pick up in our scanners, in our mouse scanners. And you have this very nice um, binding when you inject the protein IV, and you can see that the tumors are positive for the oncofetal CS. You can also do that, and this is just another model where we have followed over a longer time, and then you can see the protein in the tumor for up to like 30 hours after the injury. Um, when they bind the tumor, they get internalized. Looks like this. This is a 3D image of uh, two tumor cells, so prostate cancer cells, that have uh, the VAR2 protein internalized into small vesicles inside the cells, like this. You can also visualize this in real time. So this is real time what happens when you add the VAR2 protein to tumor cells. Then it binds up on the surface, like this. And after a little bit of time, it's usually around 20 to 30 minutes, then you start to see it appear in small vesicles inside the cells. So it binds, it gets internalized into the cells. And how it does that is through a process called macropinocytosis. It's a process where you get these protrusions that comes out of the cells, and then it uh, brings a piece of the membrane into the cell, and then it circulates through the endosome, like this. So this uh, is really the basic, or the, um, what you can say, the important background information that provides an argument for trying to link this protein to a drug. Because you have a target, 
that is only expressed in cancer and in the placenta. And then you have a targeting molecule that can seek out and bind and internalize into tumor cells. So the work here I'm going to talk about is um, mainly uh, done by Nada and Tu and Joey. Those are the main figures on, on this, this specific part of the program. The drug we chose uh, was a drug from uh, Kairos Therapeutics. Kairos was a company that was established on the CDRD here at UBC. It was later bought by Symworks. So now the drug is called something else, but we're still working with the same drug. It's a hemosterling compound that is similar to the Cial Genetics ADC molecules uh, called oristatins. Um, it's probably one of the most toxic compounds you have in nature. It's uh, from a sea sponge, a marine sea sponge. And just one or two of these molecules inside a cell is enough to kill the cell. So this specific molecule here has been modified so it cannot permeabilize cells by itself. So if you just add it into the blood circulation, it's basically untoxic. You need to get very high concentrations of it before it develops a toxicity. And uh, then you can link it to the VAR2 protein like this. And uh, the linker that is linked with has a small protease site sitting in the link that makes it cleavable by proteases that you only find in the endosome. So this drug can only be released if it's bound to the tumor cell, internalized through the mechanism I just showed you, and then released from the endosome um, when processed in the link. So we can load, or at that time here, we could load uh, three to four molecules of the toxin to each recombinant malaria protein. And this molecule was able to kill basically any type of tumor cell line in the picomolar to nanomolar uh, ED50 uh, concentration range. And it was uh, completely untoxic to the animals. You could inject even high concentrations of this into the animals and they showed no signs of toxicity as we would expect. If we look at tumor models like this, we can see that just a few hits on, for example, non-Hoskins lymphoma is enough to dramatically impair tumor growth in animals. These are mouse models. The same we see in prostate cancer. And here we were actually able to, to completely rescue about 35% of the animals. Interestingly enough, it also binds and has a very strong effect on cisplatin-resistant bladder cancer. So we developed this model together with Peter Black, where we have a completely cisplatin-resistant tumor growing in mice. And then we were able to treat this tumor and able to show a very good efficacy in this model. What we have here in the, in the lower right corner is a metastatic model. It's the 4T1 breast cancer model that I showed you before where you inject in the heart, it metastasized to the bone. And um, here we could also see that if we treat these models, so these meta metast metastatic models here, then you're also able to basically rescue most of the animals. So that was the first generation molecule. Now we are working with the second generation molecule. So this is a new, more stable protein, and it has a larger payload on it. So now it has four to five toxin molecules on it. And this molecule here is basically able to flatline tumor growth in mice. So it's much more potent um, and uh, gives a very, very strong uh, effect in animal models. The next thing I'm just gonna mention here today is how we can use this technology in immunotherapy applications. Um, this work here is mainly done by Robin, uh, Morgan Roberts and Mai and Nastron. And uh, before we go in, I just want to highlight a, a few things uh, that is important for when we talk about immunotherapy. So we are talking about cell-based immunotherapy here. So that is the cytotoxic attack by a T-cell on a tumor cell. 
and the elimination of the tumor cell. And this um, system here is uh, receptor mediated. It has a T cell receptor that has to recognize an antigen that is presented in an MSC complex on the tumor cell. And when it does that, then this cell here will attack the tumor cell and it will kill the tumor cell. But the tumor cell, they can express inhibitory molecules called PDL1 or PD ligand -like 1 that binds a receptor on the T cell that will shut down the T cells. And the T cells also need cytokines to get full activation in this scenario here. So there are many different things that play a role. You're probably very familiar with the checkpoint inhibitors that are currently having great success in the clinic. These are anti-PD1 or anti-PDL1 antibodies that can neutralize the inhibition of the tumor cells to the T cells. But what we are interested in is the other things here you have in, in, in colors. We're interested in interfering directly with this interaction here. We are interested in, uh, in uh, modifying the T cell receptors so they can attack the tumor cells. And uh, we're also interested in building oncolytic virus that can create a lot of immunogenic noise in this. But I'm just going to show you a few examples of this today here. The first one is chimeric antigen receptor technology. So this is also what is called CAR T uh, therapy. And the, uh, what is important to remember with this therapy here, or this type of therapy, is that you, you basically engineer a T cell to express a transgenic receptor that can fully activate upon recognition of its antigen, independent of the MHC1 complex. So this type of treatment does not require presentation of the antigen in an MHC molecule. It can directly bind an antigen and then take out the actual cancer cell. Um, this type of treatment has seen great success in hematopoietic cancer, where you have a chimeric antigen receptor therapy approved now for uh, acute B cell uh, leukemia, and it attacks an antigen called CD19. Um, what is less uh, successful is this type of therapy in solid tumors. Because there you have a bunch of different complications, such as immune evasion to systems and the ability of the T cells to actually infiltrate the tumor. So there are many challenges involved in this scenario here. So the standard CAR T receptor looks like this. So it has a binding region on the extracellular domain, and then it has a linked domain inside that enables full activation of the T cell receptor upon binding. Uh, of the extracellular domain. And what we did here is that we basically swapped the extracellular domain for the VAR2 protein. So now you have a chimeric T cell receptor that express a recombinant malaria protein on the outside. And the idea here is, of course, that this receptor will be able to specifically target chondroitin sulfate on tumor cells and therefore mediate T cell mediated killing. Um, these cars or VAR2 cars uh, gives a, a very nice immunogenic response. You get full cytokine production from the T cells, as you see on the upper part here. And it can very nicely produce uh, T cell mediated cytotoxicity <coughs> in vitro on basically any type of, of cancer cell line that express the oncophil CS. When we go to animals, it gets a little bit more tricky because this is solid tumors. And these tumors here uh, are extremely difficult to penetrate with the T cells, but still, we see an effect here of uh, the VAR2 CAR T cells. Another way we can use the technology is in bispecific or bifunctional uh, um, therapy. So here we want to basically artificially link the tumor cell and the immune compartment through a VAR2 based linker. And we can do that by having the VAR2 protein sitting at one end of the molecule up here. Then we can link it through a, a click system called the SPI system to either a cytokine that will activate the T cells or to an antibody, a monomeric antibody against CD3. CD3 is one of the components of the T cell receptor. So in that way you can bridge those two compartments. 
And when you do that, you see very dramatic anti-tumor responses because now you have uh, immunogenic cell killing inside my, mice. Um, this is a melanoma <coughs> studies. So this is just a, a current highlight of uh, the different programs here that uh, is currently run um, in the therapeutic space. So there's the VDC or the VATU drug conjugate program that I already told you about here. There's the bispecific program that we also uh, that I also mentioned and the CAR T program. But there's also the oncolytic virus program that is a little bit less developed. But we now have a fully functional oncolytic virus, recombinant virus produced that express the recombinant VAR2 protein in the envelope of the virus. So the idea here is, of course, that we will be able to target the oncolytic virus directly to the tumor compartment. Um, then we have a very exciting radiotherapy program that is very early, together with Larry Goldenberg and a collaborator called uh, Paul Pesner. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to move on this uh, program quite fast also. This is just uh, something I threw in here because I think this is important when you think about uh, what it really takes to develop these kinds of therapies here. So I just threw up some numbers uh, for you here, and this is what, what, it, what it actually costs in the different, in the different uh, kind of spaces here. You have the discovery. That's the cheapest part of it. Okay? This is where you make the actual discovery. It's by accident, you see something, and then you want to take it further, you want to develop it. And now it gets complicated because now you have to validate it in a very stringent manner. It takes time, it costs a lot of money. You have to do the preclinical studies in animal models. You have to down select your lead compounds, your lead uh, molecules. And then you have to prepare for GMP production. And doing GMP on complex biologics like this, or immunotherapy products like this is extremely costly because you have many different components that has to be put together. So before you actually get to a phase one, you have burned at least $10 million. And this is if the first GMP batch is actually working. Sometimes it fails. Then you have to make another one and it costs another million dollars. So, um, and, and, and everything you have to do here is, is related to both upstream and downstream development. And it has to be exactly, uh, you know, you have to scale up the system, you have to make enough products so you can actually put it into a human. All these things cost money. And uh, this kind of uh, project here is way beyond what you can attract, or at least I can attract, in government funding. So you need to engage the industry for those kinds of projects. To reach the next value inflection point, where you can raise money again, which will be a successful phase one trial. And for that reason, we incorporated uh, a company in 2012 that has been able to raise about 10 million euros to push this through this pipeline and develop it into a clinical product. So the conclusion here I want to make today is that um, I've shown you that an evolutionary refined malaria host anchor protein can be utilized to target a modification share between the placenta and tumor. And that this recombinant protein can be incorporated into experimental biologics and immunotherapy applications to target a broad range of different cancers, not only a specific type, but any cancer that will express this modification. And then I just want to, you know, um, do a little philosophy of what I think is a good tumor target. This is something that, you know, is very complex and this is just a, uh, a, 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 my thoughts on it. So what I see as a good target for cancer biologics and immunotherapy is, first of all, it has to be cell surface expressed. It's a molecule that is cell surface expressed and it has to have a low degree of expression in normal tissue. So there has to be a window of opportunity where you can actually bind uh, uh, tumors in a specific manner. 
this is uh, in contrast to uh, strategies where you would like to use small molecules, for example. Here the criteria is different. Because here you need to target something that is actually functionally important for the tumor. You don't have to, uh, what you target in immunotherapy doesn't have to play any role in the cancer, functionally. It just has to be there as a receptor for, to receive the actual therapy. But if you want to do small molecules, then it has to be a functional relevant model. Um, when we're talking biologics, so that's like ADCs or uh, the VDC I showed you here, the drug conjugate, versus immunotherapy. Uh, my thoughts on this is that um, immunotherapies, they uh, evidently mostly have a better safety profile. And that's because it takes quite some effort to get a good immune response going, actually. Even if you have a, smooth, a few numbers of antigens on your tumor cells, it's not enough to get the immune system going. So you have a better uh, uh, you know, acceptance of, of, of off-target effects when you're dealing with immunotherapy. Um, with biologics, because you're working with these very toxic molecules, then that window is not very big. So the challenges when you're doing ADCs or drug conjugates is to be able to dose high enough so you get actually in the efficacy space of the molecule. Because many times it will actually produce toxicity before. So those are my thoughts. I want to acknowledge all the funding. There's been many funding organs supporting this program over the years. Um, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you for your attention.